Uh, I am your host, Willa White, and this is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern on my Facebook page, Willow White Medium. It's an opportunity for us to have a wonderful conversation with uh, various guests, and we typically cover a topic with about spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, or more. And you can tune into the show also on um, blogtalkradio.com slash Lilydale Radio. I'm part of the Lilydale Radio family, and it's an opportunity for you to listen only if you want that feature. But most people like to see us, so you can uh, tune in on Facebook page, also on the Lilydale Facebook page, and this will be uploaded later to my YouTube channel. And I am delighted to have as my special guest today, Dr. Marjorie Roth. Thanks for being here today, Marjorie. Well, thank you for asking me. Mar Marjorie's a very special lady. Uh, she's loved Lilydale for many, many, many years. And she's a music history professor and studio flute professor at Nazareth College. And she's been a Lilydale symposium lecturer in the summer. And she's got some great things geared up for, for this summer to come, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And I think you're just going to find she's a very special lady. I had the opportunity to meet her this past summer season and attend one of her classes on the Tarantella. And it was fabulous. So I highly recommend when Marjorie's in town that you come visit. I, and, uh, you know, Marjorie has a wealth of knowledge. She and her husband are both very fascinated with spiritualism and things spiritual. And we're just so delighted that she can be on the show today. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah, thank <laughs> and you. We have a great topic in store for all of you today as well, uh, which is Sibyls and spirits, the ancient oracles. And this is something that Marjorie has really studied in great detail. Uh, before I get too far into the show, I, I forgot to mention, if you're interested in, in uh, attending any of the Lilydale Assembly workshops that are online uh, through Zoom on the off season, you can find out more about that on the lilydaleassembly.org website. And uh, during the off season, there's not much to do here in Lilydale. The churches run their own Sunday services and there's the Wednesday night healing temple service, uh, but it's pretty quiet here. You're welcome to walk around and admire the trees, but the public buildings are closed and the daily events uh, won't resume until next summer season, which is late June and into July and August. So I always wanted to get that out of the way. So uh, people aren't like, can I still come to Lilydale and, and attend all of those message services and workshops? Uh, not until next summer. So gear up for that. Uh, the next time the, the program will come out, usually in February or March. So you can plan your dates accordingly, especially if Marjorie's on the program. You're going to want to take advantage of that. And I do have uh, uh, two circles that are coming up. I, I lead a uh, mediumship development circles, and you'll have a Monday night opportunity or a Thursday afternoon opportunity. And you can find out more about that on my website, willowwhite.com, uh, for other online classes that I offer. So as I said, we're, we have today with us Dr. Marjorie Roth, and she has been well-versed in a lot of different subjects uh, pertaining to spiritual matters as well. And our topic today is Sibyls and Spirits, uh, the Ancient Oracles. So how about Marjorie, we start with what is a sibyl? Because most people don't even know what that is. <laughs> yes. Well, if you let me, can I share my screen with you oh, for a minute? Oh, yes, absolutely. Please do. So if it's okay with everybody, I'll probably just uh, be sort of as is a, zooming in and out with different pictures as we go as they're apropos. So th this is a slide from a talk that I usually give, and people always ask me this when we start this subject, what is a sibyl? It's not really a household word anymore. Um, and usually what comes to mind for people is this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Harry, Harry Potter fans know Sybils largely from this character, right? And if you look at this character, there are some things there that are re remarkably distinct about her, sort of the wild hair and the wild eyes, the wild kind of spinning eyes and the very spasmodic gestures. And if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, you know that she does have a very unusual way of speaking. Um, so I'll get rid of this right now and go back to the normal views. So if that's the issue. That's the image of a sibyl we can start with. And J.K. Rowling's is really not that far off. So a sibyl, a classical sibyl, is always a woman and usually a person who is not what I think we would think of now as a medium, 
but someone who is able to sort of move her own consciousness aside and be invaded completely by the voice of the god. And the god for the Sibyls in the ancient world was always the god Apollo. They were the his mouthpiece at their different oracle sites throughout the ancient world. And they had different they had different locations. Probably the earliest one was in Greece, in Delphi. That was the earliest one that we know about. But then very soon you had Sibyls in Italy and Sibyls in all sorts of other places in the eastern part. Um, the eastern part of the world. So there were probably 12 of them. By the end of the ancient world, there were 12 noted sites and the Sibyls were known by their, their location name, like the Sibyl of Rome, the Sibyl of Delphi, the Sibyl of Hellespontica. Um, and so the idea is you would bring your questions to the God and usually you'd sacrifice a goat. And I think the day had to be Tuesday, one Tuesday a month, the Oracle site was open and you would bring a nice big honey cake for the priests and they'd sacrifice a goat. And you could go in and you could ask your question and the Sybil would answer you, but she, it wasn't really her that was answering you. It was Apollo speaking through her. And so in order to allow the God to come in, she, they had to go through some purification rites and probably a little bit of meditation and maybe inhaling some substitute, some substances. And uh, then they were ready to give the voice of the God. And usually they did give the give the voice of the God with a not in their own voice and some spasmodic movements and rolling of eyes and all sorts of drama. So that's where the Sybil, Sybil Trelawney comes from, is those descriptions of the Sybil when the eyes spin and the head spins and, and she speaks in a voice that isn't her own. Mm -hmm. So they basically go into a deep trance state to deliver these messages from Apollo. Yeah, I think that's what we would call it. I think we would call it a trance state now. You know, I was just reading actually that just just a few nights ago about trance mediumship, which I haven't really done a different the modern kind of trance mediumship. I hadn't really done much of that until just now, and it it is a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. There's the, there's the sense that that in order to receive the message from Apollo, to receive the words of Apollo, there has to be a certain state of calm and a certain state of purification. And so one civil in in particular, her routine for getting ready for the God is, is pretty, pretty well known to us. She had to bathe first in the Castilian spring and, you know, become clean on the outside. And then she had to inhale some fairly significant burning plants. <laughs> um, and also probably inhale some gas that came up through a crack in the earth. Um, so that also gets you a little bit high. And once she was in that state, then she could sit on her special seat and give the message from Apollo, but but there had to be a there had to be preparation for it. You can't just walk in and do the job. You have to prepare mentally and physically to receive those messages, which always reminded me a little bit. It's not quite the same, but it's a little bit of the way I hear um, spiritual mediums talk about how they prepare to deliver messages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've been able to see the connection between those two preparations, in some ways. Uh, I have to say, though, with the ancient Sibyls, it sounds more like a preparing for a fire walk. <laughs> so there's that sense of, not only do you have volcanic gases, bog or whatever, and, and then the plants, but also the meditative procedure. Uh, but is that that idea of, OK, we're about to walk through fire that can have that moment of, of am I really going to do this? I'm wondering how much they got into that place of of course I can you know there's that ha having to set aside any egoic fears and doubts and move completely into transcendent state yeah well interestingly I think what you're describing is coming you know directly from the mouth of someone who has had that experience and interestingly from the Sibyls in the ancient world we don't know anything about who those women were at all we, well we know this much <clears throat> we know they were probably um not tremendously educated. Um, at first, it could be <clears throat> anyone that could be a Sybil, and after a while, they they put an age limit on it, and you had to be older, and uh, probably postmenopausal. So, because the idea was that the Sybil the Sybil needed to be pure, right? So she needed to be a virgin, and that's a little bit of a problem when you stick a young woman in a dark cave with a bunch of men. Um, so they had a few mishaps, I think, in the ancient world, and after a while, decided that it was smarter to make the Sybil a postmenopausal woman, but it is written. So we don't we don't have the words of those women at all. What they thought they were doing or how they were trained, we don't know how they described the experience. But there are experiences 
from the historians around them, the, ma the male priests, right, that work with them, that talk about what their preparation was supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, how they, and they were chosen simply based on the fact that they were able to sort of be a blank slate, which probably lends the impression that in the ancient world, they really didn't want them to be necessarily people with too many thoughts of their own, or at least not thoughts of their own that they were willing to express. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So unfortunately, you know, we don't, we don't really know what their real experience was like. We just know what the description of it from the people around them was like. I know when uh, I visited Rome, there was the, the site for Hestia, which is the goddess of the hearth, and they had the various uh, virgins of Hestia, right, that had to tend the fire. And if they didn't tend the fire and they let it go out, then, you know, but there is that, that understanding that there were various rites that they had to do and that they be also became mouthpieces that did affect political outcome and were able to influence things. So I'm wondering if that's also a, a takeoff of, of some of those other civils, that concept, and that it just kind of got carried forth with the Romans. Yeah, I couldn't say what the what the exact uh, connection might be, but it, it is definitely true that you didn't just go to a Sybil to say, well, should I buy a goat or should I buy a cow? I mean, usually you went to a Sybil to say, should I invade such and such a place, right? right? So right. a lot of high class money exchanged hands um, between the temples where the Sybils were, especially the Delphic Sybil and you know, the, that particular, that there's a lot of records about the Greek, Greek Sybil. And a lot of those things had to do with high class political decision-making. And mm -hmm. there was a certain amount of fraud. Um, there's a famous case of one uh, general who wanted the outcome to go in a certain way and he bribed the priests to translate what the civil was saying in a certain way so probably very much like the normal political stuff that goes on now um, right. it's just right. the civil could the civil's words could be manipulated if they needed to be if if they wanted a certain outcome i think that's an excellent point outcome. excellent point that people would would use that uh, in order to affect outcome and also the masses and I don't know if this is a good time for maybe you to share um, why Sybils are instrumental in, in terms of your connection with Lilydale too. Ah, uh, yeah, this is a really good question. So I'm a music historian. So of course my own dissertation work has to do with studying some piece of music, um, some piece of music out of music history. So I think it was probably as early as maybe 1992 or something like that, I was singing at the Eastman School in a small informal group of scholars. And we sang a very unusual piece of music that had the title Sibylline Prophecies or Prophecies of the Sibyls. And it was a very strange piece of music. It did all sorts of things musically that it wasn't supposed to do for the, for the style of that time. And it also uh, had a text, had words that none of us had ever seen anywhere before. And if you're a music historian and you sing lots of medieval and Renaissance music, you know that most of the poetry you're going to sing comes from some something religious that the Catholic Church used. So it's a re great recycling of texts. But then there were these poems that came from nowhere. And when you look at something like that, you think, well, there's nowhere to sing this. So, of course, this is the piece of music I had to choose for my dissertation research. I really wanted to know what, where did this piece come from? Why does it sound the way it sounds? And who on earth used this and how, you know, during the Renaissance? So I happened at that at that point, I realized that none of my teachers either knew what a Sibyl was. They told me to go look up Sibyl in the Bible, go look for the Sibyls in the Bible. Everyone assumed they were biblical figures. And I failed miserably at that and felt horrible and came back and said, there's no Sibyls in the Bible, for which I was greatly berated. And then only to find out later on that I was right. There indeed are no Sibyls in the Bible, which again raises this issue. How does the Catholic Church use music? that is supposed to be the prophecies of the Sibyls who were women and were pagans. Where do you sing this? So I was complaining to a friend of mine, a guitarist on the way to a gig once about telling them what the Sibyl was and what my problems were. And she said to me, oh, you should go to Lilydale. It sounds to me like they have a whole bunch of Sibyls down there. So the next summer I got in a car and I came down to Lilydale and I realized that the two things weren't exactly the same, but I was closer to ground zero than I had ever been before. And I sat at the stump one day and a student medium came to me and said, um, so 
you have a relative here that uh, it says you were very good at music and at performing music, at playing music. And I said, yes, I, I think that's probably true. At the time, I was also working on a doctorate in performance, but I was just beginning my doctorate in music history. And I was trying to decide which way to go, actually, either the history way or the performance route. And this young student medium said to me, well, your relative says that you're very, very good at music, but that's not at performing music, but that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be studying the harmony of the spheres instead. And he said, does that make any sense to you? And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, oh, good. And he, <laughs> and he walked away from me. But for me, it was very interesting that, that he used those words or spirit used those words, the harmony of the spheres. Because for me, at that moment in my study, the harmony of the spheres was the key word for me for musicology, for music history. Yeah, and there, I mean, that's not that's not a usual way of referring to music history, but I had a teacher once tell me that what I really wanted to study was the harmony of the spheres and not the harmony of human music. And for the for the student medium to say that to me in those terms was a real shock. And I have to happen to be with a friend of mine who was sitting next to me, and she was probably the only person on earth who knew at the time what the harmony of the spheres meant to me. And when he said that, she just doubled over. She put her head down on her knees, and she started to howl. And I'm sure that we looked like a very strange pair to all of the people up, uh, sitting at the stump. But that was really that was really the beginning of my uh, a certain kind of my thinking about my topic, when I was able to actually watch the medium's work and process what I'm seeing along with what I had studied from the ancient ancient world about how Sibyls worked. And yeah. I still love to do that. It's one of my favorite things. I, I like to come down for a week and I just sit in at the out, outdoor meetings and watch everybody work. And I've been doing this for like 25 years now. So beautiful. Oh, see, isn't that a lovely story? <laughs> I just I just think it's wonderful the way you've been able to tie that in to something you're very passionate about. And that exploration, that eternal student, even though you're a teacher, the eternal student within you. And then for, for spirit to coordinate that so beautifully through the medium is just phenomenal. I mean, that's what it's about. The spirit world is definitely helping to bring that forward. And we just have to pay attention. And what a, what a great thing, because it, it is unique. That's not something that would normally be said. I love it. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really quite a message. And there have been actually two or three you know, that that have been pertinent to my own research that have have sort of touched on certain kinds of my own internal language for the way I'm understanding what I'm doing when I, I will occasionally get a message that I think, oh, yeah, wow, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking about where I want to be going with a certain kind of idea. And it's said to me in a way that that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that's my, you know, that's my beginning Lily Dill connection, which I think was must have been probably 1993, something like that. And back then, at that time, I remember too, there were lots of musicians that I knew from Eastman who were coming down. My my guitar partner was one of them. But I remember seeing so many members of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra um, on the on the grounds, you know, when I when I was down there, just visiting for a week, taking their time off. Well, you know, my first uh, occasion to understand Sibyls is when I visited Italy and I, I could see the Sistine Chapel and you can see what Michelangelo has painted on that ceiling, not just, uh, you know, that uh, the divine spark being exchanged there, but then on the, the outer edges, all of the prophets and Sibyls that uh, were part of the prophecy of Christ. And so as you research those, some other people, if you've been been there or, or read about this, you know what I'm talking about. There, There's that, well, that's a curious thing that Michelangelo was allowed to even paint and have these symbols there. And thank you. Look, look, Marjorie's got a picture for us. Right. This is this is exactly what Will is talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That, that he was allowed to do this. I, I, My understanding is that when when they asked him to do the Sistine Chapel, he said, I'm a, I'm a sculptor. What do you want from me here? You know, I, I I do the Statue of David and stuff like those, those things. La Pieta, which is fantastic. But uh, he said, as long as I'm allowed to paint whenever I want to. Like he he wanted pretty much carte blanche to, to paint in there. And he included these Sibyls. So that's why when you say, you know, your, your teacher said, hey, it's in the Bible. The Sibyls are in the Bible. They get it because it's here. It's on 
it's it, it, it's been preserved throughout this history now uh, from the Middle Ages on, we've been able to, to have visuals of these symbols. Yes, you're exactly right. And I think this is people who would, it was totally normal for my advisors to assume <clears throat> that I should find symbols in the in the Bible. And it's partly because you're exactly right, Willa. It's partly because of this ceiling. So this is a very, very tiny picture. I can I can make it slightly bigger, but not much. <clears throat> so if you're standing down on the bottom of the floor of the Sistine Chapel, which is really not that big, right, it, uh, space wise, uh, ground floor wise, and you're looking up, this is the ceiling that you see. And of course, the old Sistine Chapel ceiling was just the typical Renaissance thing. It was a dark blue field with golden stars on it. So you're looking up into heaven. And Michelangelo's idea here is to do this different kind of ceiling, is that you're looking actually beyond that ceiling of fixed stars into sort of the 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 history of human salvation that lies mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it is true he didn't want to paint this, uh, but he worked for a, a particularly forceful pope that uh, got him to eventually do this. <laughs> and the the place where you can fall into the pit the the little pit that sibyls come from the Bible is if you look at this because they're up there. These are our sibyls, but then this guy here, where can you see my cursor? Uh, we can, yes. Yes, okay. So this person and this person and this person, so the ones who are opposite the Sibyls, these are prophets, and they are, of course, in the Bible. So if you know that the prophets come from the Bible, it's completely logical to assume that Michelangelo put them up there with other figures from the Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, who must be these Sibyls. And that's where things get a little bit hazy. This the, the time that this was uh, painted, which was the early part of the 16th century, there was a very interesting phenomenon going on in Rome, especially in Rome, um, a kind of Renaissance humanism where the learned people like the popes and the priests and the scholars, anybody who was literate, were being able to read for the first time all of the Greek wisdom that came in from the ancient world. And that Greek wisdom included Plato and um, Greek scholars who had, or Greek philosophers who had not been accessible to people before who couldn't read Greek. But now that we can read Greek, we suddenly understand this whole realm of history that we didn't really realize before was there. So when you look at the Sistine ceiling, you're seeing a program here that gives us the Hebrew prophets who were male and pairs them with this whole new class of, and let's put this in parentheses, prophetesses who are female and pagan. So you're looking at the ceiling here and what you have according to Pope Julius and to Michelangelo is look people, Christianity is the, is the natural confluence of these two very useful trends. In other words, we're not getting rid of uh, Judaism and paganism. Instead, we're taking the best of Judaism and paganism, fusing them together and using that in our modern Christian world. This was the tremendously optimistic view of the early 16th century, is that now that we've discovered history, let's use it. Let's learn something and take what's good from both of those cultures fuse it together and apply it to what we're doing now as Christians trying to reinvent our church. And now remember, we're right on the eve here. We are minutes away here from Martin Luther knocking on the door with his thesis saying, Catholics, you're all doing it wrong. But the Catholic church was actually involved at this time in a kind of reassessment of itself once it could look at the past religions and try to fuse them and harmonize them with Christianity. And to a certain extent, that was a little bit what some of the Protestant reformers were against, is the idea that the Catholic Church at that point had become literally very Catholic, right? They were trying to pull it all in and find a way to fuse it together instead of silo things. And so the Sibyls got involved in this project completely by accident. No Sibyl ever prophesied Christ. The, you know, obviously the prophets do it. The words are right there in the Bible. But what scholars were able to do at this time is look at the recorded sibylline prophecies, find any mention of the birth of a boy and say, oh, look, they mean Jesus. This means Jesus. And yeah. that's how those girls wound up on that Sistine ceiling is through this process of sort of interpretation 
and saying, oh, look, we need to balance the male Hebrew prophets with the female pagan prophets, and now we're perfect. This is These are the two pillars of Christianity. And so the Sibyls kind of came in on the coattails of the prophets and were just reinvented to be prophetesses of Christ. And there we have it. Yes, there you have it. Yeah, there we have it. My my favorite one is that they grab uh, the acrostic of one of the Sibyls um, and they, they said, oh, they, I, I had written this down because I did a lecture about the prophets uh, and Sibyls. And they, they were spelling this out, Jesus Christ, God, Savior, Son, Savior, Cross. And it was a, you know, acrostic is a poem or a word puzzle. And so they, they got it down to that. Like, look, it showed up here in this acrostic even. And I just thought that was, that was hilarious. But there, it usually was like leaves that they would use, right? That particular civil used leaves. Which, which civil? Oh, the, the... Um, yeah, the Erythrian. Sybil, she was said to have predicted the Trojan War and prophesied to the Greeks who were moving against against Ithium, both that Troy would be destroyed and that Homer would would write falsehoods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's it's fun it's fun that the, the first letters of the leaves always would form a word. Let's see if I can find it in here. Yeah, and this is so. These are I I think this is it. This is a long. Uh, it's a long prophecy. Uh, this is, I think, what you mean, yeah. right? So now this is, so this is one that was actually did come from this book, this book here called the Oracula Sibylina, which was probably not really the Sibyl's own words, but a very long collection of Sibylline oracles that were created later, probably by men with the political mm -hmm. agenda. Um, sure, sure. But some of these were written by Jews, some were written by pagans, and some were written by Christians. A small group of them were written by Christians. <clears throat> but this is one of the, the Erythrian civil, like you say, she's the one who, who predicts the end of the world. She's the one who says the end is coming. Right. And this is her famous ac acrostic. And this is what Willa is referring to, is if you look at the beginning of every line of this rather scary text. Can um, you where share your screen? Us, uh, we can't oh, see your oh sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. I didn't share it. I found okay. it, but I didn't share it. That's okay. There you go. How's that? Thank you. Yes. There you go. This is what uh, what Willa means is this is this is part of her long, scary poem. It goes on a little bit longer than that. But the beginning of it ends er, the beginning of the poem has each line with a letter that I have in blue here. And if you read it, it says Jesus Christ, son of God. And allegedly, the idea, the presence of an acrostic like that, an embedded secret message is what a really the acrostic is. The rumor was that a Sibylline oracle was authentic if it began with an acrostic. And so whoever wrote this one, um, I can't remember right now which century this comes from, but you, most of them come from right around the first century, just before, right after. Um, and this comes from the Christian layer of the Sibylline books. And whoever it was who wrote this one knew that if he put an acrostic like this in the beginning of it, everybody would say, oh yeah, that's a real Sibylline oracle. Yeah, that that was the mark. <laughs> yeah. The extra special thing. And the other thought, one that uh, Sybil I thought was interesting was the um, Cumaean. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. The Cumaean uh, yeah. Sybil. And, and so I thought that one was especially inter of interest to you because there were singing involved, right? The singing of the fates. Well, let's see. And in that Aeneas. particular one, um, that simple showed Aeneas the way to Avernus, which is the underworld. And so it had more to do with that understanding of um, acting as a, the Sybil acting as a bridge between the worlds of the living and the dead that particular symbol yeah it, exactly and let's see so this is probably one of my favorite pictures of her so most of the symbols as they're predicted at, at least as they're drawn in christian art as they're given to us in christian art most of them are actually kind of nice looking um but this one is supposed to be super 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 old and and a real tough girl, right? This is the the Cumaean Sybil. She has actually has a name. Her name is Al Al Amalthea. Um, she's really old and she's really scary. And let's see if I can. Yeah. <clears throat> 
so see, these are some of the things that she's famous for. She's famous for being really tough and burning her own books when someone won't pay her for them. She burns them off in history. She lives in a very, very spooky cave um, in the Campi Flagrei, which is the volcanic region around Naples. Um, and as Willis said, she does indeed help Aeneas into the underworld. And I think... Aeneas would have been on par with like Hector. If anybody's familiar with the Iliad during the Trojan War, Aeneas would, be, would have been like as big, tough guy as Hector. And then Avernus is, is the word for the underworld. For the underworld, right. And yeah. she's going to take the him down into, the, she'll take him down into that underworld so that he can consult his dead father and mm -hmm. she gets him down there i'm sorry i have to leave my slides up like this on the side um she gets him down there because she lives in this scary volcanic range this is another great picture of her by the same artist um so she's really a tough a tough girl um she's living in this volcanic area and her underground cave this is the actual cave that is it's just north of naples uh, that you can visit if you can get there. Uh, Leonard actually went there. My husband Leonard went there once. And oh. my very first cell phone message came from this cave. Oh. Uh, the first the first cell phone I, <laughs> I ever had in my life. Um, he stood in the middle of that cage and, and called me from, from the, the Sybil's cave. Um, so this is what it looks like to get into that cave and then the, the real cave. And then artistically, these are some renditions of what it looks like. Right? She lives around, her cave is around this lake and it always is spewing these kinds of volcanic gases and things like that. Um, and then from that lake, you can get down into this cave. Right? You just fall. And there is actually a, a blocked passage there. I mean, ar archaeologically speaking, there actually is a oh. blocked long passage now that goes down to a dark and watery place that smells a lot like sulfur. So probably people in the ancient world were writing about that space when they try to describe what the Sybil's home ground looked like. Wow, this is fantastic. I hope people are really enjoying that, that Marjorie's done this extensive research. <laughs> we just saw the, the, uh, the home of an, of an ancient Sybil. <laughs> and of course, think about what she's doing, right? So this Sybil is, on the one hand, she's taking Aeneas down into the underworld. And what will happen is he'll get down there and he'll have all sorts of adventures. And when he comes out, he will actually found the city of Rome, which is the whole political point of this. Yes, but what is she yeah. really doing? She's she's get, putting him in contact with, with his dead father, right? So he can get, so like a almost like a spiritualist medium, her, her function there is well twofold it's to give him a message or allow him to question a message from his dead father mm -hmm. and also to sort of bring him through another world into and through another world which he would not have access to without her con without contact with her so even though it's not perfectly the same you know as what goes on with spiritualist mediumship today it's the same general idea yes. is contact with a place that most of us don't know how to have access to and messages coming in from people that we've lost. Mm -hmm. And and that happened throughout many ancient texts that they would talk about experiences with spirit. And sometimes that was uh, able to be done by that individual. And sometimes it had to be facilitated in this story by the civil, by the medium. <laughs> <clears throat> right. And, and actually, you know, it's it's not exactly true to say I'll just share this last one with you. It is true that there is no Sybil in the Bible. There is no Sybil in the Bible. But what there is in the Bible that I think some of you will recognize is this story, right, of the witch of Endor, right? Mm -hmm. That's the closest that we get. And notice the word witch is used. So not prophetess, um, not medium, not anything, but the witch of Endor, right? Or or something in the original language, something equally slightly not so uh, complimentary <laughs> right so the idea here is that in the in the old testament the idea is that you sort of take this person who is able to give you contact with the world of the dead and you associate them with some scary and not particularly well accepted sets of skills <clears throat> right so prophets don't put you in touch with the dead but 
there are women in the ancient world that we're aware of, like this one, who can do these spooky, not accepted things. So that's as close as you get in the Bible to there actually being a Sybil there. And I think that she's described as having the same kinds of methods as the ancient Sybils were, um, but but put in a, in a fairly negative context. Right. That's correct. But usually it's because, as, as you were uh, alluding to earlier, this understanding of uh, political things that were going on during those times. So in this case, uh, you know, she's helping him, Saul, King Saul, connect with Samuel and have advice, have connection. And in, another, in, in other places of the Bible, you do have mediumship occurring. And one of the, the most famous ones that a lot of people don't remember is the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. Right? Oh gosh, so, you know, I never thought of that. <laughs> right. So he goes up there and and uh, he takes a couple of his apostles, a few of them, and, and they love it up there so much. You know, one of them says, let's stay up here. This is awesome. And he only, he's up there and and he's talking to Moses. He's talking to Elijah. He's, they, they're having a meeting. And so this is something that people did. And it, it did, does show up in the Bible. You just got to know how to look at it, to look for it. And it's something that prophets did. It's something that kings did. And if they can do it, then also the common man can as well. And that's what modern spiritualism really helps people to understand is that they can build that connection themselves, that uh, things that maybe needed to be separated and only, only for the powerful, the power is now in your hands to connect with God, the divine, and your loved ones in spirit. So it's kind of- no, You're exciting. absolutely right. I, I, I haven't thought of that. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a Bible scholar by any, any, uh, any stretch of the word. And also I- the religious tradition I grew up in was the Catholic religion. So, you know, we read like the golden legend and all of the great saint things, but we don't tend to read the Bible very much. Um, but the little bits I know, and Leonard is actually quite, quite good, at, quite impressive in his knowledge of the Bible. So when we talk about these things sometimes too, I, I do get a little bit of, a little bit of information, but you're right. I never really thought of it that way is depending on how you want to interpret some of the scenes, the great dramatic scenes of the yes. Bible, they can yes. very much be mediumistic kinds of things. Yes, yeah. So and the, the successful for men and for women. Are, are there some other symbols that you think would be important for people to know about today? <clears throat> well, it, it's probably would be nice to give credit where credit's due here. And um, uh, let me let me see if I can go back and find her. And if anybody has any quick questions about symbols, you can put that into the Facebook chat and we'll do our, our best to answer them live here uh, in the, in the li next little bit of time we have. So if anybody has anything. And you can also let us know that you love the show. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so it's probably nice to, to mention, again, I apologize, I'm not gonna do full screen here because I, I'm probably gonna wanna jump around. Whoops, I just jumped around too much. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, probably going to want to jump around a bit here. So we probably should give a little bit of uh, credit where credit is due here to this character that's known as the Pythia. And she really is the ancestress to the Sibyls that we know, to, to Michelangelo Sibyls up on the, on the Sistine ceiling, to his five, and also to the 12 that we know. She's probably ground zero, right? This, this Sibyl here what is probably was not dedicated to Apollo. She was dedicated to an earth goddess. It's really interesting for us to pay attention to the fact that the very first Sibyls, there we go, I can make that a little bit bigger. The very first Sibyl uh, was a female goddess, or the earth goddess, Gaia or Gay, the, that she was devoted to. And she was tended by female priestesses, not by male priests as the ancient Sibyls were. And she also was guarded by a very large female snake called the Python, which is how she gets her name as the Pythia. So this original oracle was kind of an all-female business, right? Um, and she was, like her, like her later uh, successor at Delphi, she had lots of attendants. She did the burning hallucinogenic drugs and the, the everything like that. So, it, But the, the, the rumor has it, if I can go on here, let's see. 
that uh, she her this this was her site her her oracle site was taken over by Apollo. At some point, Apollo felt sorry for human beings because they couldn't tell their future, and so he was looking for a ready-made oracle site. Fixed his attention on hers, and there was a great battle, a great big battle, where he killed the snake, the horrible snake that was guarding and ruining this oracle. Killed the snake, which is kind of metaphorical for got rid of the snake and the priestess and the female god, and then occupied that site. And from that time on, around 700 BC, <clears throat> we know of that oracle site at Delphi as the, the Delphic Apollo, the Delphic Sibyls site, which is an Apollonian site. And if you look at a lot of um, images of Apollo, like this one here, sometimes you see that a little snake on the thing. And that's a, that's an reference to his conquering that Pythia and taking over this oracle site. So it's kind of an interesting thing to contemplate that at one point, this whole business of sibylline oracles was a exclusively female thing mm -hmm. that then was taken over by a male god. And the role of the of the sibyl became considerably more passive. Right. She she was now a mouthpiece for his words. So I, I don't I don't I never have and I probably never will go down the the full rage feminist rabbit hole on this, but the 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 lines of of the lines are there if anyone wants to do it. <clears throat> Beautiful. I'm I'm glad that you're sharing about this because it, people need to understand the sequencing of history so they can understand and, and value how far it's come. And you know, as much as there are power plays that we've we've talked about throughout history. And it's, it, of course, when we think of the snake, if you're thinking in a biblical way, you're thinking of the snake that showed up in the Garden of Eden. And <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you're thinking about that. But snake is also representative of rebirth and uh, change and also has medicinal, the medicinal qualities that are associated with that too. So, I mean, so the symbolism of a snake is, um, uh, most of us are going to say you, myself included. <laughs> most of us are going to be like, no, let's kill the snake. But it, I, I think it's interesting that it, it's had that, um, it's following a formula that shows up. Um, and Joseph Campbell, I'm sure, would run with this in terms of the 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 myth and and how that perpetuates. But it's all part of bringing us into what is the spiritual understanding that we, we can have about these moments in our lives? And I think that's what's so fascinating about Sybils is they, they really put it in perspective for people that you could have uh, advanced information, you could have help from the divine, so the divine could talk through someone is, is also beautiful. And so we take more of those beautiful aspects. And I can understand why those are things that uh, we're allowed to be up on the Sistine Chapel and extrapolated upon because we're building on history. And so those are some of the main symbols that you think people would rec recognize. Yeah, I think those are, well, we've we've talked about three that are up on Michelangelo's ceiling, the, the, and really they're the three biggies, right? So so the, the Sybil of Delphi tends to be the one that's associated with um, the beginning, the beginning of Christianity, right? The birth. She 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 prophesies a lot about the nativity, mm -hmm. um, and the Erythrian Sibyl is the one who who tells us all about the end times, you know. And then the Cumaean Sibyl is sort of the reality girl in the middle, you know, that reminds us kind of how tough how tough you need to be, you know, in order to yeah yeah. She was she was just such a tough old broad, you know, and she very tough. Yeah, and so I think that those three are kind of my three favorites. And there's really only five that get much play at all in the ancient text. The other ones are mentioned, but we don't know very much about them. Yeah, I, I but really, those are the um, three I've been reading about the Libyan Sybil. That was the priestess that, uh, in that case, there's another snake connection, right? Because uh, the mother of the Libyan Sybil was Lamia, meaning serpent oh. or Medusa, right? So they have a snake connection, folks. Yeah, you really have done your homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and so she, she was the first woman to chant oracles, I guess. She would chant them. Yeah, it's interesting. She's described as twittering like a bird. 
Um, yeah. And sometimes that comes across as singing. The other thing that's interesting about that Sybil is I, I'm very sorry, but I don't have an image of her um, in this slide set. I'm oh, too bad. Um, she doesn't get very many images, but um, on, the, on the floor of the um, cathedral in Siena, there are some big um, mosaic pavements, pictures of all 12 of the Sybils, and she is black. She is depicted as very, very dark black. So she comes from Libya in the form of a bird. Mm -hmm. um, and she gives her oracles in a very musical way, but that it's such a beautiful image. I, I, I would really have to search my computer to try to find it. But if you have Google images, if anybody out there has Google images, all you would need to do is push Google Siena, S-I-E-N-A, -E Siena Cathedral and Libyan. And I'm sure you get a picture of it. There's up. a lot of them out there. Yeah. So it's, it's a, that it's a understanding of, of birds as messengers. That is something that carries on into modern times as well. That birds can be messengers. That the music of the breeze can be the message as well. And so that's carried on. I mean, I, I've lost count of the number of times people have felt that their loved one in spirit is communicating them communicating with them through a bird and a bird visitation or just how the, the bird, bird is interacting with them. And so I can see how some of it might stem from this and it can actually happen. I'm not saying it can't, but it's just, it's interesting how these are really ancient understandings of connecting with spirit and with God. Right. And you just opened up a very interesting, uh, so bird, bird noise, a song, bird song we say we don't say bird noise we say bird song because somewhere back in the very back in here we know that that certain sounds are musical you know and that's where you get into the harmony of the spheres thing right a musical sound connects you musically to the harmony of the cosmos and if you think about messages that way um i'm just thinking about the the oracles of jupiter of zeus um he didn't use singing his his oracles weren't singing they were um the rustling of the leaves right the way the leaves run together that that natural sound is a kind of oracle so it delivers a message and if you want to think of that sound the rustling of leaves as music if you're able to do that then again that's a way of thinking that's a kind of harmony and it's harmonizing me with the harmony that is divine mm. so you have to be liberal with your description of music but if you can do that as they were in the ancient world right they they really did think of what was harmonic in a very different way than we think of it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. We should do another show just talking about that kind of stuff. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great. Oh my goodness. Well, this is a lot of wonderful information for people so that they can start to delve more deeply if they wish into the world of civils. Because uh, it, it, the, the ancient does cross over uh, into the modern uh, whether we re recognize it in those moments or not, but later on, you'll be like, oh, that's why uh, we as a culture and we as a human race have this understanding and communication point and that it all stems from what has gone before. And the as much as people um, think in terms of the oracle and of the prophecy, it does seem that the civils were doing even more than just prophecy, that they were holding a space for people to know that the divine was accessible in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the ancient world, Sybil's definitely part of all this, but I think the ancient world in general was maybe a little bit healthier than most of, most of us are nowadays in terms of their ability to... Um, find ways to be immediately themselves personally connected to the divine. We, we tend to be quite by many steps removed from that experience in most of our traditional kinds of religious experiences. And if we should encounter something direct, it's actually alarming instead of something that might be, might be really great. But I think there were a lot of different ways of, of coming in as close as you can to direct contact with whatever is divine. And that could be just through nature, through dreaming, mm -hmm. through consulting an oracle, um, through a process that Leonard is very uh, uh, familiar with. There's three the theurgical kinds of stuff. Um, he, that was what his talk was about a lot this summer. The lightning talk had yeah. a lot to do with that. Yeah, that was a great um, talk. So there's a lot of accessibility, you know, to 
whatever we want to describe as divine. I think also it's a little hard to talk about those things nowadays, especially in the academic context, because we're not supposed to talk about any one religion or any religion in general, because people who aren't religious might be upset by that. So it's very difficult to have these kinds of talks in an academic situation where you're really not allowed to talk about about those things. So the way I usually get around it myself is just to say, define the divine in any way you wish to, according to your tradition. And if you don't have a tradition, define the divine as a historical concept. It doesn't have to be reality. So if you put it there, now we can talk about these, these things and decide, you know, do we want to practice dream analysis? Do we want to consult a medium at Lilydale? It opens up a kind of space to at least discuss these things. And I'm finding, at least in academia these days, it's harder and harder because of everybody's identity politics. It's harder to have a discussion about these most fundamental things, you know, that we all really want to talk about. Yeah. But there's always going to be the possibility that someone will come in with Title IX and get you fired. So. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, see, you know, that's something that I've, I've considered. Uh, there's that a bit of the battle between the secular and the sacred that goes on and the more we move into a secular world the the sadder it all becomes so it's really important to remember that sacred and to infuse our world with that understanding that sacred understanding as much as we possibly can because that's what helps us to really view each other as souls and bring that light to the occasion to the event to the situation that you're in so, you know, bringing in the, that ancient sacred and the modern sacred and merging those in your own life can really bring a, a whole nother level of value. And I, I'm glad that you persist, <laughs> persist in your own way to encourage people to look at um, not just music, but history and, uh, you know, religion and see how they can be merged uh, for a greater world view. So thank you so much, Marjorie. This has been wonderful. We really appreciate you coming today and sharing this with all of us. And I, we, I can't thank you enough for being here today. Oh, well, I know we, we've come to it to the end of our, our particular episode, but thank you everyone for tuning in to Wednesdays with Willa today. And please let, let Dr. Marjorie Roth know that you appreciated her being here and sharing her immense knowledge. And uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week on Wednesdays with Phila for another great show. See you then, everyone. Bye-bye.